for organic chapter 15 to get us started i will have a short video here to kind of bring us back up to speed with a little bit of the things that we covered in class when we started chapter 15 prior to taking exam two and we'll discuss the general reaction scheme that we'll see throughout the rest of chapter 15 and then quickly the reactions of acyl chlorides. And then I'll cut the rest of this chapter up into hopefully similar small videos to discuss each of those concepts in turn. So we're picking back up here with reactions of carboxylic acids in derivative section two. Okay, section one would be what we covered in class, which is pretty much just boiling down to knowing how to name these things, right? The nomenclature for carboxylic acids and all those derivatives, and then their physical properties. But of course, organic is all about reactions. And so we need to know how these things react and the mechanisms that we're concerned with in this chapter. And, and we discussed these first couple of slides in class right at the end, okay, just predicting the reactivity of these things. And going back to our understanding from chapters 9 and 10, right, when we learned about substitution and elimination reactions, we were focused on an electrophilic carbon. Okay. A nucleophile came in and attacked an electrophilic carbon and knocked off the leaving group. And we're continuing that same line of thought, right? looking at this carbon here in the middle. And you see that delta positive there. Right, we again have an electrophilic carbon okay. attached. Now we're thinking about this carbonyl group, that C double bond O. Okay. And that electronegative oxygen again causes carbon to act as an electrophile. Okay. But the mechanism for these reactions is a little bit different. We don't just immediately knock off the leaving group, which is Y in this situation. We actually go through a tetrahedral intermediate, something that's sp3 hybridized, shown here in the middle. Um, and that's the new part. Other than that, a lot of the concepts are the same from chapter 9 and 10. Our nucleophile, Z, in this situation, comes in and attacks our electrophilic carbon. Okay, but the weakest bond is what breaks first to prevent us from forming a Texas carbon. And in this situation, the weakest bond isn't the bond between carbon and the electronegative element, it's the pi bond between carbon and oxygen. So that bond breaks and takes me from an sp2 hybridized carbon to an sp3 hybridized carbon, and this is my tetrahedral intermediate. Okay, but we discussed this in class, that tetrahedral intermediate attached to multiple electronegative groups is extremely unstable. Okay. So we always form that tetrahedral intermediate, but it quickly collapses because those electrons are just being pulled too many ways. So the big question in this chapter is what gets kicked off when that carbonyl reforms? Okay. Does the original leaving group Y get kicked off and form something new like it's shown here? Or does Z just get kicked back off again and we don't form a new product? And that comes down to the same idea from chapters 9 and 10, thinking about the fact that the weakest base is the best leaving group. Right? It's all about basicity, going all the way back to the beginning of the semester. Yeah. So in this situation, right, we're showing the beginning, forming the tetrahedral intermediate. It's the same thing that we saw before. But now we're considering the possibility, if you look at the note on the bottom, if the incoming nucleophile is a weaker base, then that means it's a better leaving group. So when this carbonyl comes back down, it just gets kicked off. And that'll happen in solution, but we never see the formation of a new product. Okay? It just goes back to the reactants. So nothing happens. But if the nucleophile that's coming in is in fact a stronger base, then we get a new product because Y in this situation, the thing highlighted in yellow is a leaving group. Okay, that's the weaker base. That's what leaves when the tetrahedral intermediate collapses to reform the carbonyl. And that is what this entire chapter 15 is about. They're called nucleophilic acyl substitution reactions, right? Because your nucleophile has replaced a substituent that was attached to an acyl group. We discussed that in class. And they're also known as acyl transfer reactions or nucleophilic addition elimination reactions, but the accepted name is nucleophilic acyl substitution reactions. Now there is one 
third possibility that we will see a little bit in this chapter. That's if the two groups, Y and Z, the incoming nucleophile and the original leaving group, have similar basicities. And in that situation, we do get kind of a mixture of our reactants and products. Half the time it goes backward, the other half it goes forward. Yeah. So that's all we're considering in this situation. What we need to think about, and something you'll want to have in your notes if you're jotting things down, right, is that carboxylic acid derivatives, what this chapter is all about, will undergo a nucleophilic acyl substitution reaction as long as that new group, that incoming nucleophile, is a stronger base. If the thing that's coming in is a stronger base, the reaction's going to happen. If it's a weaker base, then it's not, which is following all the rules that we have discussed in the past. Okay? And that's what this slide 33 on my slide is about, right? We're still breaking the weakest bond in each situation. Previously, that was the bond between the um, electrophilic carbon and the leaving group. That's the chapter nine material. Now, as I mentioned before, it's the CO pi bond. Okay? Weaker base, better leaving group. That's the theory that we have to have for the rest of the semester. Yeah. So jumping into that, right, we can think about something we, that was introduced in class, right, the relative basicities of the leaving group. Chloride is the weakest base relative to an alkoxide or hydroxide. And your NH2, we've used that as a strong base, right? So clearly that's going to be the worst leaving group. So the thing that has the weakest base has the best leaving group. That's the most reactive. And acyl chlorides are the most reactive carboxylic acid derivatives. The weaker the base that's attached, the easier it is for those reactions to proceed. So acyl chlorides are most reactive. Esters and carboxylic acids are similar to one another. We'll talk about some differences. And then amides are the least reactive of our four derivatives we're considering in this chapter. So the question is why, right? Why are acyl chlorides the most reactive? Well, not only do they have the best leaving group, Right? Those weak bases also don't share their electrons very well. Okay? So if I have a weak base over here where Y is, that means if it doesn't share its electrons well, which is shown in this step right here, then I have less of a contribution from this resonance contributor that's over here. Okay? Meaning I've got more from the resonance contributor on the left, which is where my positive charge is on the electrophilic carbon, where I want it, because I want that thing to act as an electrophile. I don't want the positive charge to be over here on my leaving group. Okay. So that helps my first step happen when my nucleophile comes in, and then we discussed before a weaker base is a better leaving group. Okay, so both steps in a two-step reaction are made better by having a weak base where Y is right here, okay, where Z is the incoming nucleophile. Okay, so I mentioned this before, right? We're thinking about the base. A reaction's only going to happen if a stronger base is coming in. A different way of saying that is your carboxylic acid derivatives can only be converted to a less reactive carboxylic acid derivative. And so I'm going to jump back a couple slides here, meaning I can convert an acyl chloride to anything on the right-hand side. Right? but I can't convert a carboxylic acid easily to an acyl chloride, which is what this slide is summarizing. Okay? Acyl chlorides are a really good starting material because you can convert them to anything. Here, acyl chloride, stronger base with methoxide, I can do that reaction. Right? But taking an ester in this situation and trying to convert it to an acyl chloride, that's a weaker base, better leaving group. That reaction doesn't happen which is something that should 100% be on your radar, right? Don't fall for those reactions. If it's no reaction, go with your gut. You can't convert it to a more reactive derivative. Okay. And looking at the reaction coordinate diagram summarize what we stated before. Okay. If we're trying to speed these things up, it's only this middle reaction that's going to happen, where we have a less stable carbonyl going to something that's more stable, aka less reactive. So this is the only one that's going to happen for us. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, we're going to think about each one of these derivatives in turn, starting with acyl chlorides. If these acyl chlorides, we just mentioned, they can form carboxylic acids from water. They can form esters 
from alcohols, it can, and they can form amides from amines, okay? Because in each situation, we're taking a nucleophile that's, that's a stronger base and bringing it in. And all of these reactions that are shown here on slide 40 follow the same general mechanism. It just depends on if your nucleophile is neutral or if it's charged. So looking at those reactions, and you should practice writing these mechanisms out. As a matter of fact, you can go through and start with each one of these things on slide 40. Actually, start with the top two and, and try and write out the mechanism using what we've discussed already. Pause here, do that, and come back for the end. Here we see an alkoxide, right, RO minus, coming in with an acyl chloride, okay, strong base attacks the electrophilic carbon, breaks the pi bond, form my tetrahedral intermediate, which is unstable. Okay, so that collapses, reforming the pi bond, and the question is what leaves? Okay, it's the weaker base, which is chloride, so I've converted an acyl chloride now into an ester. Simple mechanism. We're gonna continue to do it. A couple subtle changes here and there, but if we look now at converting an acyl chloride to an ester, with an alcohol now instead of an alkoxide, the only difference is I have this proton that's hanging out here. So first step, the same, right? nucleophile attacks the electrophilic carbon. Then I have this protonated intermediate, so I have to deprotonate that first, but then pi bond comes back down, chloride leaves, I form the same product. Okay? The only difference is that intermediate here is a protonated ether, those are very strong acids. And because of that strong acid, sometimes you have to pay attention to what else is contained in solution. If you're trying to convert an acyl chloride into an amide, you can do that by reacting it with ammonia, because again, that's a stronger base than chloride. However, right, when you do that, you do end up with an extra proton in solution. Notice we went from NH3 to NH2 here. That proton in solution is going to be picked up by ammonia. Okay, to form ammonium, NH4 plus right here. That's no longer going to act as a nucleophile. NH4 plus doesn't even have a lone pair. Okay? So protonating inhibits its ability to act as a nucleophile. So we just have to have 50% of that ammonia available as a sacrifice. Right? When you're trying to convert an acyl chloride to an amide, you can do it with ammonia. You just have to use two equivalents, which is a big idea. Okay, so the overall conversion right here, right? if you were to write that out, it's actually shown on the previous slides right here, right? two equivalents of ammonia, or in this case, an amine, right? to convert to an amide. Always requires two equivalents because of that proton that gets picked up. Okay. So that wraps up acyl chlorides in our intro to reactivity. In the next video, we'll discuss esters, and then we'll get into carboxylic acids and amides.